Well, hi folks, good afternoon and uh, hello for all of you joining us live. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to have you tuning in to today's event to learn all about Central Oregon's early spring wildflowers. I am uh, a lover of wildflowers, of course, and a gardener. So it's always so exciting to get to look at these flowers and I'm excited to learn a little bit more about them. I'm glad that you're here. My name is Rebecca Ratcliffe. I am the Outreach Associate for the District Land Trust and will be doing my best to facilitate our event today. So as a reminder, our presenter will be the only one with the mic on during this time. This will just help us hear them more clearly and help the rest of us be able to focus in on listening. We'll be sharing additional information in a follow-up after the event, as well as resources and places you can learn more. So don't fret if you miss an interesting tidbit. Um, we'll be sure to keep you learning after the fact. For those of you who are not yet familiar with the Deschutes Land Trust, we are a conservation organization local to Bend, Oregon. We're currently protecting and caring for over 17,000 acres of land. Um, that's critical wildlife habitat, incredible streams, and just stunning natural beauty. And the places where a lot of these wildflowers are. With our usual calendar of naturalist guided walks and hikes is a little bit different this year, but we are offering a few in-person walks and hikes and some virtual events. So we're glad that you can join us for this virtual event and be sure to check out our online calendar at issueslandtrust.org to find some of those in-person events. Um, if you're enjoying our virtual contact or those events, um, today's talk, please consider making a small donation to the Land Trust, your support conserves and protects the nature of Central Oregon. I'll be sure to put the donation link in the chat so you can get there. Um, and we so appreciate your support and so do the wildflowers. Without any further ado, I would like to introduce you to today's presenter, Carol Moorhead. Carol has um, felt a great sense of place in Central Oregon since moving here in 1976. Her love of the natural world began in alpine biology, which she'll tell her story about. Um, she leads walks and hikes for the land trust. Um, and since she was, since she, she became a volunteer master naturalist, um, she's uh, been hiking ever since. When she's not hiking among the wildflowers, you'll often find her on her bicycle, um, where she recently completed a pretty epic cycling adventure. Um, Carol, go ahead and take it away. All right. Thank you, Rebecca. So yes, as Rebecca mentioned, my interest in wildflowers started in a college uh, alpine biology class. We spent a couple of weeks backpacking in the Washington Cascades and primarily we're identifying the wildflowers and looking at other ecological uh, parts of our world. And uh, even though I didn't go on to get a botany degree, I went a different direction. I have uh, continued to enjoy wildflowers and enjoy identifying wildflowers wherever I lived. Moving here from uh, Western Oregon, I discovered the high desert shows us just a little bit different uh, creature. Our wildflowers here have to adapt to the arid high desert climate, the wind, uh, lack of moisture. And so most of our flowers are growing much closer to the ground. We have to be willing to, to look down and maybe even get down on the ground to, to see some of them. But what we're going to cover today are just a few of the early spring wildflowers we see. And we chose the showiest ones, of course, to, um, to share as well. So. Let's get started with the first one. Um, this is Goldfields or Crisidium multicale. This particular flower is quite small, maybe only six inches high. And um, if they're growing just individually, they're not that showy. But what we often see are they grow in large groups. And here's a an example. So this is something you might be looking out your car window and go, what is all that yellow out there? And um, that's what it is, these, these gold fields. Each stem bears just a single composite or daisy-like head. Uh, the ray flowers, which are only about a 
quarter to half inch long surround the, the disc flowers, the center. And they um, have something, this is interesting that the, there's always a reason for the um, botanical name. And this one, Crocid, means in Greek, means uh, loosely woven cloth. And so if you do get down close and see uh, where the stem and the flower meet, there's lots of woolly hairs. And so one of the reasons for that botanical name. So as you can see, the flowers, um, they usually have eight rays around those uh, disc flowers. And um, again, they are one of our earliest wildflowers to pop up generally in March, we'll, even early March, we'll see these flowers. Then this is one of my favorites. One of the most unforgettable uh, characters, I think, in the sagebrush country is the yellow bell. It's a lily, uh, Fritillaria pudica. It's a small, small lily, again, uh, maybe not even six inches tall sometimes, uh, but they can be in large colonies as well, not quite as many as the, as the um, gold field. But these flowers, they, they have a lily-like leaf, so it's elongated, fleshy, and then a bright yellow nodding bell-shaped head. And the blossoms do turn orange with age. So here's, here's an example of one that is aging. The interesting uh, part about the botanical name of the yellow bell, uh, pudica, means nodding or bashful in Latin. So I think being bashful is kind of the, the nodding blossom. Um, and these bulbs, interestingly enough, like other some of the other wild lily bulbs, have been eaten by the Native Americans. Um, Again, they're in probably large enough groups that you could collect a few, but they're so beautiful. I, I can't imagine eating them myself. Um, Meriwether Lewis on the historic uh, journey that they did came through Idaho and in 1806 did collect a, a species to take back with them of the yellow bell. So they've been around here for quite a while. Then another early bloomer is phlox, spreading phlox um, or phlox diffusa. And these, uh, again, phlox in Greek means flame. So it's a good dis description, I think, of what these look like out uh, in the wild. They're a mass of colors. Usually they're maybe a, a pinkish or a lavender, but they can be white or blue. There can be lots of, of variation in that blossom color. They're, they grow quite low to the ground and they have this mass of leaves and the leaves actually are quite pointy and sort of needle-like. So um, they, that is their way, I think, of protecting themselves. And the flowers, I think we have one other picture here. The flowers uh, fuse and make kind of a trumpet shape. And this is my favorite. Well, another of my favorites, the sagebrush buttercup. Um, interesting, buttercups usually grow in a, a wetter climate, a moister climate by streams and such, but this particular uh, species has adapted to our more arid uh, climate. And uh, because these do tend to grow near streams, rana, or um, which is Latin for frog, is part of the botanical name. So they relate to the aquatic habitat of most buttercups. And indeed, the, the Indians would collect, the Native Americans would collect these blossoms and uh, make a yellow dye out of them. Whether they 
came here and collected these or stuck with the ones uh, uh, along the stream, I'm, I'm not sure. But these buttercups um, have kind of a fleshy leaf and they're shallowly lobed. And then they have these bright, waxy, shiny yellow petals, generally just five of them around the center. To me, they look like they've been kissed by the morning dew, even in our arid climate. Fresh buttercup. And then uh, another small flower, prairie star, or lithophragma parviflorum, is um, kind of unusual because of the blossoms. They are so um, unique in their shape. They tend to grow toward the top of the flower. And the botanical name, parviflora, means small flower. So these again, uh, maybe only about six inches tall. They have kind of a reddish stem and their blossom is, is white or pink, typically. They have um, four or five petals uh, in the inflorescence there. And the leaves uh, are basal, so they're only at the base of the plant. They don't tend to grow up the stem. And they uh, also are lobed. Generally, um, they're three lobed. And um, actually, if you see, you can see the almost anywhere now, um, even at our elevation, you can see the leaves, not always the flowers yet. Although I did see just a few of these blooming uh, at Weiches Canyon yesterday. So the roots of these are, are quite fibrous. And here they are growing more uh, in the wild. There is another um, lithophragma, which a uh, different species that has uh, little red bulbets uh, up on the leaf axles and on the um, flower axles. And they do tend to start, uh, they can fall off and actually help propagate a new plant. This one is not blooming yet, it's, um, but it is starting, the, the green leaves are starting to come up. This is another in the lily family. And this one um, from the name death camas, you might guess, is not uh, a bulb that you'll wanna dig, dig up and, and try to eat. Um, it is a uh, similar, I believe some of the habitats it can cross over with camas that the uh, Native Americans used to uh, gather in great numbers and um, then steam or heat in some way and eat. This particular one has um, some, uh, what, uh, trying to think, alkaloid. It has alkaloid in the, um, in the root. And so it is not something that you would want to consume, or even that livestock can consume. But it has pretty cream colored blossoms, uh, and they're born on this long um, stem. And they tend to elongate actually as the flower gets older. So here's one maybe just a little bit younger. So notice the blossoms are closer together. And when it grows older and longer, then um, those blossoms are a little further apart. The leaves again are lily-like, they're um, kind of fleshy and long, and these I have seen already out in the wild now, the leaves, but not, not the blossom yet. Interestingly, um, this has been demonstrated through experimentation that honeybees can actually be fatally poisoned by feeding on the nectar of this plant, um, which seems kind of a conflict of interest for, for the plant itself in order to continue to propagate itself. So that's the foothill death camas. We have actually another species in this area, the meadow death camas, um, but that's in a little 
a uh, little moister areas probably like along the Metolius River. And then another favorite, the sand lily, uh, Montanum. And uh, again, this name has meaning. Leucos uh, means white in Greek. Crinum is uh, lily in Greek. And then uh, Montanum of the mountains. And this is very low growing as well. It has uh, the, the leaves form kind of a rosette at the base of the plant. And then the blossoms come out and they don't have a long stem on them. So they're very close to the ground as well. They have a pleasant scent. Um, so you may, if you come across them, um, recognize that wonderful smell. And um, six lance-shaped lance petals in the bloom. And these begin uh, sometime in April. I have not seen them out at our elevation yet. Um, the rosette, the leaves have started to come out, uh, but the blossoms not quite yet. But there's an example of how they can propagate from their, they have kind of a fleshy root system. And in some, uh, some dry years, they can lie dormant um, for a year. And then as we get the moisture back, uh, they come out again. Interesting, I was reading recently that uh, these lilies, uh, sometimes also called star lily, uh, and others, uh, they make an extract from the blossom and um, use it for um, a whitening agent, like on the skin or uh, supposedly stimulating cell renewal. I've never tried it, but I have seen that it is in some uh, products at the, at the store. And then this one too, uh, it's maybe more of a early summer flower rather than a late spring one, um, the larkspur, common larkspur. But um, in certain areas, uh, maybe a south facing area where it's protected from the wind and gets more sun, it can come out uh, a bit, I, can, I think in the spring as opposed to summer. And all larkspur, wherever they grow, have uh, bilaterally symmetrical flowers. So if you cut that flower right in half, you would see that the left and the right halves are equal. The two lower petals are a little broader than the upper. Um, and it's always a beautiful color, although these two can, can vary somewhat. But the interesting thing is speaking of pollinating, these flowers have kind of a nectar guide. So if you look up here, you can see all these lines in the white uh, part of the blossom. And this is telling the bee to land here and come right here. So this particular flower knows what to do to, to encourage pollination that it needs. So each of these flowers, and I'll just run back through them slowly. Let's see, we have one more. This is a good example of how you might see the delphinium growing in our area. And you can see the leaf here too. It also is um, mostly basal and um, at the base of the plant and very divided. And sometimes that's how you have to identify a plant if it's a flower isn't blooming yet, um, if you can learn a bit about the leaves as well and what they look like, that will help you to know what, what is growing there. So each flower has made um, its own adaptations to our arid climate. And by growing, certainly by growing low to the ground, that's one of the adaptations. And um, 
notice, for instance, here on this sand lily, I mentioned these leaves are pretty flat to the ground. So it has these sort of channels or canals where the water then is collected when there is moisture to come in to the base of the plant. So it's another adaptation to our climate. Um, this one too has those kind of the, the lily-like leaf with those channels that could bring any of the moisture in toward the base of the plant. The star flower doesn't have that, but um, certainly by being small, um, it is one adaptation to our climate. I wanted to mention something about common names because that is how I learned wildflowers. I've um, been continuing to try to learn more about the families and the botanical names simply because common names can be a bit confusing. Um, for instance, if we go back to the Chrysidium, that uh, common name gold fields which makes sense when you look out and see this type of gold, but also I've heard them called gold star. So one plant can have up to three different common names. And I, I was reminded of this when I did take that bike trip across the US and I was so looking forward to being in Texas at the time that the blue bonnets would be blooming because I just heard so much about the blue bonnets. And indeed, that particular species is endemic to Texas. But when I looked out at the landscape, I went, oh, those are lupins. Um, I know those, we have lupins here. And uh, so it is helpful to know a little bit about uh, the botanical name or a little bit more about the plant than the common name as you go out and explore. So these are the flowers we decided to share with you today. Um, they're the early flowers that hopefully you can see um, the Chrysidium out right now and even it like this. Um, the blue bell or the yellow bells I have seen um, not at White, Ch well I saw one at White Chist Canyon yesterday. They're not really out in full force at White Chist Canyon yet. Um, I did see them in full force at a lower elevation at Otter Bench. The phlox um, also is not yet out at White Chist Canyon. Again, uh, I think a lower elevation walk, you could probably find them. The sagebrush buttercups not yet out at this elevation, uh, but I have heard from people who've been out by Haystack Reservoir in the Madras area that they saw a number of sagebrush buttercup blooming there. And the prairie star flowers, I also saw a few yesterday at White Chist Canyon, but I saw a great number of them uh, when I was at Otter Bench just a week ago. These I've not seen out yet, except for the just the greenery. And I saw one that looked like it had bloomed already yesterday at White Chist Canyon, but mostly just the green basil leaves are what I see out right now. And I haven't seen the larkspur at all. So I will let you ask questions now, Rebecca, if there are any. So far, um, thank you, Carol. Uh, and thanks everyone for giving a couple of questions in. I'll give folks a few more minutes, a uh, minute or so to ask a couple other questions. You can do that in the question and answer function or in the comments if you're watching live. Um, in the meantime, I'll just 
encourage you um, and thank you for the folks who have decided to support the land trust today and um, support the, the land and protecting the land that some of these wildflowers exist on. Um, so thank you so much for that. You can become a member by donating using Facebook donation button or by visiting our website at theshootslandtrust.org slash support. I think I've got a few questions popping up, so I will cruise on into them. The first question is an easy one, Carol. Do you have any wildflower walks coming up this spring? Yes, I do. On um, April 18th is the first one. And then there's another one, I believe, on May 4th. And then we're still um, contemplating a, a June date as well. And all of those are at Weiches Canyon. Um, so we would see different flowers each in each of those uh, walks. Some of the same perhaps, but uh, new ones pop up, so. Super, yeah, and I'll, I'll add to your comment there, the in-person walks and hikes through June will be heading onto our website at theshootslandtrust.org under the hikes tab. You'll be able to find them starting April 1st. You'll be able to find early season ones if you hop on there right now. So um, hop on there and registration is required online. And you can see our COVID guidelines for safety and you can register one month in advance is when registration opens. So um, do keep an eye out for some wildflower walks out there at Wysoos Canyon. Um, another question from Karen uh, wants to know, how are the trail conditions at Wysoos Canyon? And I do think, Carol, you were just out there scouting for wildflowers before our talk today. So how were things? Well, um, actually, it's been a very dry spring. So um, I did not go down to the creek because the best wildflower section is um, the, the above the creek trail. And it was in very good condition. There looked like at one point, it might have had a couple of spots that were a little muddy. But overall, the trail conditions were very good. Yeah, and, and now is kind of the time to get out and start looking for some of these flowers. So Waitus Canyon Preserve is open for exploring. You'll see our um, our COVID guidelines when you arrive there, but it's open. You can check out trail maps and all of those things on our website. So do go try to find a few of these. Um, yeah, and you will see, see the Presidium, definitely. <laughs> good, good. It looks like Mary here has a question specifically while we're kind of on this train about Waitus Canyon, about where is the good wildflower trail? Which hike would be a good one to go on? And I know Carol, you you have a, a route you take. Yes, I think the best is, so there's sort of three parallel ones. There is the Santiam Wagon Road, which is up a little higher. And then there's the creek at the bottom and there's one in the middle. And that's the best um, for wildflowers. It also has excellent views when you're looking to the west. Wonderful. Craig here has a question. Is spreading flocks and prickly flocks the same thing? Well, that's a good question because again, I mentioned the common names. <laughs> And I would guess that yes, but it would be a guess because, um, you know, the different common names, unless, you know, until, like, so spreading phlox is phlox diffusa. And um, I don't know whether prickly phlox, phlox is phlox diffusa, but I know that they have needle like leaves. And so it feels prickly. And so I would guess, <laughs> yes, but I, I can't be sure. Yeah, it's, it's tricky without those names. I, I get things mixed up all the time. Let's see, I have a couple of questions here from a few folks about deer escaping and trying to encourage these wildflowers to spread and um, a, a specific question about, is there an effective way to propagate some of these plants? Do you have any answers for any of those kinds of questions? If people want to have 
these plants growing more at their homes or? Well, I think any uh, suggestions? I, my suggestion is wait until they're in seed and and get the seed and try that way. That's the, for wildflowers, either that, or if you can purchase some from a reputable uh, nursery that really focuses on propagation of um, the native plants, that would be the easiest. Uh, they work really hard to propagate those native plants and how they do it is typically for almost all species is going to be to go out and collect the seed. Yeah, and you know, the Land Trust um, has worked with a few different nurseries in the area that focus on native plants. So Winter Creek and Clearwater native plants are ones that I could, that could suggest to anyone that's looking those up. Um, and I could tell you just from my experience, I started um, not worrying about natives, just doing perennials and that now I'm trying to slowly switch to natives. So the ones that I've had the most luck with, um, and I have primarily bought them from Winter Creek or one of, one of the nurseries, the native nurseries, um, the Scarlet Gelia, which is no longer Gelia, but um, the botanical names have been changing as, as they do DNA testing. And, um, but Scarlet Gelia was easy to propagate as was um, the Areogonum or the, the desert buckwheats. Uh, I found both of those pretty easy to um, transfer to an area in my garden that doesn't get extra water. I, I gave them a little water in the beginning to get them going, but, but they're not in an area that is irrigated now. I've got another question, this one about fires. So Sarah is asking, with fires being a part of our ecology here, are any of these flowers benefiting from fire passing through or do they get destroyed in areas that fires occur? Um, do you have anything you could share about how some of these flowers might be adapted to fire? Well, I'm trying to think of a specific species, but I know, of course, it's going to depend on how intense the fire is. If a fire goes through and clears off some of the brush and isn't, doesn't um, too deeply affect the soil, that generally can be a benefit to the wildflowers. And um, but if it's a very intense fire and um, you can see the soil uh, microbes are also damaged to a great extent, then, then that isn't very helpful for the wildflowers. I can't uh, remember or think of a specific species off the top of my head. I mean, fireweed is an obvious one. Um, and I know there are others, but I'm right now blanking on um, what that might be. I was gonna mention the photo that has a lot of sand lilies in it that you shared. That is a photo taken in the fire in the burn area at Skyline Forest. Ah. Um, Skyline Forest, just outside of Bend. Um, and you actually see those sand lilies came up after the fire there. So, you know, different, species do different things, that's different kind of fire conditions, but I just thought that was an interesting tidbit that that was a post fire photo. Um, yeah, that's good. With that's lots of flowers good. in there. Yeah. And they do tend to, you know, I mean, the flowers love the sun. So in some ways, overall, clearing an area can be positive. Let's see. Um, the next question from a couple of different folks is do you have any books or references that you would recommend um, or maybe even a bloom time calendar that you could recommend to folks for trying to get out and see some wildflowers and, and learn more about them okay yes um, well the Wildflowers of the Pacific Northwest by Mark Turner and Phyllis Gustafson. 
if you can see that. Um, we can put this up um, later so you can, can get the name. That is kind of the current Bible for just uh, plant ID. And it's set up in sections uh, of color of the blossom. So that makes it a little bit easier. And um, there are also some apps um, that are available for Oregon wildflowers has an app. So you can take it out in the field um, with you and that's pretty helpful as well. All right, I'm cruising through to see what other questions we have here. Looks like a few folks just letting you know they're seeing all kinds of flowers blooming. Some folks have been out to yeah. Chimney Rock recently and saw all kinds of good stuff out there. Oh, yeah. Nice. And what else? What to do? Okay. Okay. Um, then the last question I think we'll ask for you, Carol, is that are there any flowers that you're really excited to see this year? Um, or, or do you have a favorite wildflower that comes up? And um, then any tips, last tips for someone going out and trying to find some of these flowers that you've talked about today? Okay, so two questions really. Well, um, one of my favorites is the Mariposa Lily, which um, we don't have a picture of here but um, you can probably find it on the uh, Deschutes Land Trust website. And it doesn't come up, it doesn't blossom, bloom until July when most of these other wildflowers have already given, given up because it's so hot. Um, it's quite unusual, but it is quite a beautiful blossom. And then as far as um, getting out and seeing the wildflowers. Well, it sounds like Chimney Rock might be a place to go. <laughs> Anything right now with a little bit lower elevation than where we are um, is likely to have some flowers growing. And I'd say with this warm weather that we're getting within the next couple of weeks, um, they should be really popping up at Wychus Canyon as well. Great, yep. And once they're out there at Wychus Canyon, any tips for anyone on um, like where to look, what to look for, um, or just uh, get out well, it, and, and see what you can find? <laughs> it, it does help to have um, more than one set of eyes. I usually like to go out with someone else so that, you know, they might see something that I've walked right by. Um, but you do have to really keep your head down it's hard when you want to look at birds and the blue sky and things like that as well, but um, because the flowers are so low to the ground, on that center trail of Wychus Canyon, um, you start out a little bit on the north side, but then you come out into um, more uh, sunny area and that's where we've seen uh, lots of flocks, um, the the uh, yellow bells, maybe just a little before that. Um, there is lot, and then sand lilies, the biggest group of sand lilies would be after you come out from that middle trail. If you turn left, there's a uh, rock overlook. Go beyond that, just, mm, I don't know, not very far. And there's a great, a very sandy area. And those sand lilies are everywhere. So I've already seen the, the, um, the basil leaves. So I know it's probably gonna be a pretty good year for them as well. Super, well, thank you so much, Carol, uh, for sharing your advice and for sharing all of this information. A, a couple of folks asked if the information and the slides will be available afterward. And yes, we will share uh, these slides with folks um, in a follow-up email. Um, and then I did have someone ask uh, about a specific property that they were hoping to visit and we'll have in-person hikes being scheduled for all kinds of properties 
to go and visit the spring and fall. So get on our website and check those out. Um, thank you again, Carol, so much for all of your information and insights. Folks, look out for her in-person walks and hikes. Um, and we hope we can join you out on the trail soon. So thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, thank Carol. Oh, lots of thank yous coming for Carol. All right.